Good morning, mighty men. Consistent with other historical revivals, the move of God in Jamaica in the 1860s was marked by a deep sense of the presence of God, conviction of sin, and physical manifestations. Some, like the father of John the Baptist, were even made mute for days or weeks. Souls in need of salvation would cry for mercy and would shake under the power of God. It's said that some went into an unconscious state for an extended length of time only to wake, telling stories of the wondrous visions that they had. Thousands were converted and baptized, and many of them formed evangelistic bands that would go from house to house sharing the gospel. That doesn't sound too unusual until you find out that these bands could have as many as 100 people in them. The sale of Bibles multiplied by five, gambling houses closed, marriages were restored, crime reduced, and alcohol sales slumped, and along with that, drunkenness was reduced. However, because of all this, there was also persecution of Christians. Some of the converts of African descent were called to be missionaries to West Africa, while the London Missionary Society's Congregational Churches decided to recall the missionaries from Jamaica because the church there had grown so strong and could stand on their own. The United Presbyterian Church of Scotland, the Baptists, the Wesleyan Methodist churches all prospered greatly from this revival. And by 1863, the Methodists at Kingston said, quote, Holy fire was still burning, though the leaders were weary in well-doing. Elmer Towns and Douglas Porter wrote about Jamaica in their book, Ten Greatest Revivals Ever. When the excitement of the revival passed, the largest part of those awakened continued quietly in their Christian profession. The nation of recently liberated slaves had discovered their real liberty in Christ, and most chose not to return to the bondage from which Christ had set them free. That's what prayer and revival can do. Our Bible reading today is 1 Kings, the 12th through the 16th chapters. 12 and verse 13 says, And the king, this is Rehoboam, answered the people harshly and forsaking the counsel that the old men had given him. He spoke to them according to the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people, for it was a turn of affairs brought about by the Lord that he might fulfill his word. And then in verse 28, So the king, this is now Jeroboam, took counsel and made two calves of gold. And he said to the people, You have gone up to Jerusalem long enough. Behold your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And he set one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. And you can still visit that site in Dan. It's an archaeological site. I've been there. 15 and verse 29, As soon as he, this is Basha, was king, he killed all the house of Jeroboam. He left to the house of Jeroboam, not one that breathed until he had destroyed it, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by his servant Ahijah, the Shilonite. Let's pray. Lord, we see that you work out your purposes in the affairs of men, even when their sin is being used to accomplish your divine plan. And Lord, we pray that you would use our current circumstance, this discipline that you're bringing upon our nation, to fulfill your purpose, to revive your church. Lord, set us free from sin. Send a slavery to sin, from gambling, from lotteries, from divorce and drunkenness and sexual perversion and violent crime and all the ills of our society, Lord, that we would no longer have government corruption and greed in business and deception in media because there's been a spiritual awakening. No wicked entertainments or pastimes. Lord, send revival in Jesus' name. Amen.